Our modern world is built on oil. So the issue of there being enough oil available in the future is a critically important one. The subject is often framed with a subconscious assumption that the world is much like a giant oil tank that is slowly being emptied. With this image, the main concern is usually when will the world run out? This statement contains two basic questions. How much do we have left and how long will it last? Both are very sensible questions, and to find some answers, the first port of call is usually BP, who every year publishes the Statistical Review of World Energy. They tell us that global proven reserves are 1 trillion 383 billion barrels worth, enough at current production rates to last for 46 years. So seemingly there is nothing to worry about. We will not run out for a long time yet. But thinking this would be a mistake. These are two simple answers to two simple questions, and both quickly crack when put under some scrutiny. Like most things in life, the truth is usually more complicated than it first appears. If we start at the beginning, we know that the world is only so big, it is finite. So therefore there must have been a fixed amount of oil in the ground before we started drilling for it 150 years ago. This amount is termed oil originally in place, and here are the current worldwide estimates for all the different oil sources. While the estimates themselves may vary, theoretically these numbers are fixed. This is how much oil the world actually has. But most of this oil will forever remain in the ground. It is only possible to extract a percentage of this total amount, and this recoverable amount is defined as the resource. Adding in additional liquids from coal and gas, the International Energy Agency estimates that it is possible to extract up to 9 trillion barrels of oil with today's technology. To give you some perspective, the total amount of oil consumed to date is around 1.2 trillion barrels. But this 9 trillion is what is technologically possible. It does not factor in the barriers of cost and energy. Energy is the key barrier. The whole point of going to all the effort and expense to get the oil out of the ground is to gain energy. Energy profit is what society is after. But oil companies don't operate out of social virtue. They're there to make a dollar profit, and this is what BP's figures of 1.4 trillion barrels actually represent. Oil that has a high certainty of being financially profitable, and this is labelled a proven reserve. These barriers of cost and energy are very real, and this is why most of the 9 trillion barrels of oil will forever remain in the ground. So whenever you hear the term proven reserves, note that this doesn't actually tell us how much oil we have left, but rather how much oil is economically worthwhile to get out of the ground at today's oil prices with today's technology. This number will continually change. It will go down as we consume oil, and it will rise when oil prices increase, technology improves, and more oil is found. So the real answer to how much oil is left is very much open to interpretation. One can legitimately say that humans will never run out of oil. There will always be a lot of oil in the ground that is not profitable to extract. However, in practice it is a question of economics. The BP figure of 1.4 trillion barrels may be correct today, but over the long run, technology will improve and oil prices will increase. Both will change the economic equation and result in larger reserve estimates. So how much oil we have left is as much a question of what people are willing to pay for oil as it is about geological limitations. BP also says that at current production levels, this 1.4 trillion barrels will last for 46 years, implying that we will not run out for a long time yet. Yet if you put a visual of this seemingly sensible statement next to historical oil production, it does not make sense. Oil consumption has always been rising, but this does not factor that in. 
If we do so, we get a much shorter time period of around 35 years. But the idea that we can pump oil out of the ground at a rapid rate until one day we suddenly run out makes no sense either. There must be a slowing down period of some description, and reality will have to look something similar to this. The exact shape of this curve is impossible to predict, but the one thing we can guarantee is that we will not produce oil like the first two scenarios. So while BP's use of the reserve to production ratio is technically correct, to the average person it can be quite misleading. They use this ratio because the real answer to how long oil will last is almost impossible to answer, as it involves predicting many uncertain variables such as future economic growth, oil prices, oil demand, decline rates, government policy and technology. And no one has managed to accurately predict a single one of those yet let alone all of them together. Under this scenario, we will not run out for a long time yet, but the question itself becomes entirely irrelevant. Instead, the question we should be asking is, when will you and I no longer have cheap and easy access to oil? Because if this changes, our current way of life may not be possible or affordable. As you can see, there will be a reduction in flow a long time before BP's 46 years are up. In fact, there is a lot of evidence to suggest that there will be a reduction in flow within the next 10 to 20 years. But the problems will start to occur before this peak in production. When slowing output is unable to keep up with the steadily increasing demand, oil prices will start to soar. So the size of the tap is more important than the size of the tank. It is the tap that controls the flow, and the flow is what controls the price. It is the flow rate we should actually be concerned about, and not specifically the amount of reserves remaining. Control of this tap is what concerns the politicians, and this is what they are talking about when they mention the phrase energy security. If you care about having a job, and there being a healthy economy, you should care deeply about energy security. It should also be made clear that this is not an issue about energy per se, but rather an issue about liquid energy. Virtually all of today's transport is dependent on a specific type of liquid fuel, and switching to coal dust overnight isn't exactly an option. In a globalised world, the monopoly oil has on the transport sector represents a massive economic risk. A risk they'll be extremely expensive and time-consuming to reduce. But the greater the dependence a country has on oil, the greater the consequences will be when the flow falters. Energy security is a wide-ranging topic, but essentially it boils down to two elements, having adequate reliable supply and at a cheap price. Reliability of supply was traditionally linked to the geopolitics between exporters and importers and the long-term supply contracts they shared. But today, oil is mostly traded on world markets and involves numerous middlemen. So geopolitics has become far less of a factor. Like most other commonly traded items, oil is something called a fungible commodity. This means oil can be easily interchanged or exchanged and allow shortages or restrictions in one part of the world to be quickly overcome through multiple trades until the oil gets where it needs to go. Effectively, all of the world's oil producers pour oil into a central repository, and oil consumers pay for the privilege to suck it out. In this classic supply and demand situation, reliability of supply is determined by there being enough spare capacity in the system to cover this demand and not by which particular country you live in. Like most systems, it does not run at 100% all the time. There is always some spare capacity in the system. The oil industry tries to stay ahead of the game by investing in new supply. However, this can be eroded at any time by unpredictable events including accidents, armed conflict, and a fickle mother nature. Under the current arrangement, the gap between supply capacity and demand becomes the critical factor in measuring reliability. This is not easy to measure directly, but given that we also need to measure affordability, 
Oil price can be used to measure both, and because of this it is an excellent overall indicator of energy security. Price generally lies somewhere near the intersection of supply and demand. Price affects supply, and supply affects price. The same can be said for demand. Price affects demand, and demand affects price. If the relative value of oil was to rise above the perceived value of alternatives, such as biofuels or taking public transport, this would likely lead to a reduction in demand, and, after a time lag, a reduction in price. By the same token, increases in oil price would also increase the profit margins for oil producers, which, over time, should lead to an increase of supply, causing oil prices to fall. Profit margins are also affected by the cost of production, which is largely determined by the quality of the oil source and the technology required to extract it. The rate of supply is also determined by the geological limits of the resource base, politics, and the availability of skilled labour. This is a little complicated and hard to wrap your head around. We can instead pretend that the oil industry is like a car driving on a highway. The speed of the car represents the amount of oil the oil industry can supply, and the speed limit represents the worldwide demand for this oil. In order to maintain speed, the industry needs to apply constant pressure to the accelerator of financial investment. If the car were to drive above the speed limit, oil prices would go down, representing an effective speeding ticket fine to the industry. Should the car's speed drop below the limit, prices would rise. While this is good for each individual company in the short term, in the long run it is not so good as the company is in competition with many others and would soon lose market share. So the overall effect is that the industry as a whole wants to drive as close to the speed limit as possible. The trouble is that the oil industry operates on a very different time basis compared to the rest of the world and thinks in terms of decades. This is because it usually takes anywhere between 3 to 10 years for an oil field to go from discovery to production. This means there is an effective time lag on the car's accelerator of at least five years and makes sticking to an ever-changing speed limit extremely challenging. This has important implications for our supply and demand model, as it could take as long as five to ten years for a high price signal to translate into additional supply large enough to reduce price, during which time we as consumers, and in more ways than one, will be paying a high price. Reason enough to be paying very close attention to the industry's ability in meeting future demand. Oil depletion makes the balancing act even more difficult, as humans tend to be smart enough to grab the easy stuff first. This is forcing the industry to either extract oil from less productive sources, or from more challenging locations that are more expensive and time consuming to develop. So at the same time the world wants the oil industry's car to speed up, it is having to climb a hill of ever-diminishing returns while the accelerator's time lag is becoming worse. It is a recipe for unsteady acceleration, and no matter how hard the pressure on the accelerator is, eventually the laws of gravity and aerodynamics will win out. It is just a question of timing and in order to know when the oil industry will be unable to match the speed limit, we will need to know just how powerful this car is. As we do when we drive a car, there are three main dials on the dashboard that we can look at to give us information on how well the car is travelling and able to respond to changes in speed. These dials include the fuel tank like resources gauge, speedometer like production rate gauge, and the energy profit meter, which operates very much like a rev counter. We also need to pay attention to the speed limit of demand. This will obviously go up, but at what rate and by how much. So that is what we will be covering in the upcoming chapters. 
the background story behind each of these key indicators and what they are all reading. Once we have done that, we can come to some conclusions about our future energy security with liquid fuels, in terms of both oil price and reliability of supply. We need to first start with examining future oil demand, so please click the link for the next chapter to begin. Thanks for watching.